Hello, everybody. Welcome to Behind the Lens, a virtual uh, studio visit program hosted by the Museum of Contemporary Photography. Uh, my name is Natasha Egan, and I am the executive director of the Museum of Contemporary Photography. And we are very excited to be here um, today to visit uh, uh, Vera Luter's studio. Um, I have a few thank yous before we get started. Um, in particular, I would like to thank the generosity of the Terror Foundation for American Art for their COVID-19 relief support, uh, which is directly assisting the museum to provide our virtual programs um, today. I would also like to thank the Philip and Edith Leonian Foundation for their continuous support of the museum's educational programs. Um, in addition, I would like to thank all of my colleagues, uh, my mighty uh, small staff. Um, who have seamlessly transitioned all of our programs um, and invented new ones um, to, uh, to, to go virtual. So please follow all of our programs um, on our website at mocp.org. Uh, we have what is called Photos at Zoom on, uh, on Wednesdays at noon. Um, and we also have um, uh, Behind the Scenes on Fridays at noon. And we have workshops. We did a wonderful cyanotype workshop uh, yesterday. So please join us for future ones by looking at mocp.org. You know, now on to the studio visit. Um, I'd like to um, welcome uh, Vera Luter um, and give a little bit of background uh, before she gets going. Um, in 2001, uh, the museum uh, commissioned Vera Luter to turn rooms in Chicago's office buildings into camera obscuras and photograph the Chicago's downtown. Uh, the results were remarkable and the museum is proud to hold um, Vera's work in our collection uh, from that project. Um, uh, and we have a collection of about over 16,000 uh, works of art. Um, I'm sorry if you can hear the sirens. I am speaking from downtown Chicago. Uh, so if you can hear that, uh, my, my apologies. Uh, but living in the city here, I'm actually communicating from the museum uh, uh, in downtown Chicago to each of you. Um, so Vera has done a lot of work since we commissioned her uh, in 2001. And in particular, she has just finished a, um, a large commission at the LA County Museum of Art uh, that is an exhibition titled uh, Museum in the Camera that was due to open on March 25th um, and has now been postponed and it's the LACMA is hoping to open the exhibition um, on July 1st. So uh, the way today will work is Vera is going to walk us through her studio and we're very excited to see her studio and her dark room which is a very a, a real treat. Um, I will be monitoring the question so I ask that you um, ask your questions in the Q&A box. Um, and I'm happy to see the chat. Thank you for all of you tuning in from Portugal and London and Chile and Wisconsin. Um, uh, that's wonderful to have you all here um, as our audience. So thank you very much. And I'd like to welcome uh, Vera, take it, take it over. Let's see your studio. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm so excited to be here. I'm Vera Luta, and you see me seated in my studio. Um, it's an honor to speak to so many of you, and I had no idea that people really would um, dial in internationally. So I think my, my internet may have just frozen. I repeat, I'm Vera Luta, and um, thank you, Tosh, for the invitation. I'm in my studio and will now start walking you around a little bit. I've just joked with Natasha um, it's almost 20 years ago that we for the first time worked together and um, it's been a wonderful opportunity and it's wonderful to now kind of have another opportunity of a different kind to discuss works with her and with all of you. I will now pick up my laptop and walk around my studio a little bit. I'll look to um, hold it as steady as I can um, to keep the image still so that you can actually see what I'm talking about. So this is a little bit of an overview of my studio. I'm, I'm in New York City in Manhattan 
and i um, very, very lucky. Um, I live in the West Village, which means with my bicycle, I was able to come to my studio every day ever since we had the stay at home order in New York. And I've tremendously enjoyed that. And I've hung a few pieces here for you. This is a piece that I felt really related so much to what I um, worked on in Chicago 20 years ago, where this piece um, instead was made in New York City. It shows the Chrysler building. I go a little closer to show you more detail. But it's all about exploring cityscapes and our urban landscapes and the, the inherent beauty of it. And um, just like Chicago, New York, I like to say, used to have really exciting architecture. And this piece I made to some degree to preserve a view of this beauty because for the 30 years that I've lived here, I've found that so many spectacular, beautiful and uplifting views of the city have been built up and we can't see them anymore. So, I'm moving over to another classic, which is an image from Venice. In 2005, six and seven, I had the opportunity to work in Venice, Italy and photograph the city. My original dream was to photograph San Marco flooded, which I actually achieved. And I'm honored to say that the image of that um, event is in the Houston Museum of Art. Um, but obviously being in Venice, I found so many other hugely interesting and beautiful subjects to photograph. Here we see the um, Church of Santa Maria della Salute, actually really meaningful right now because it was built after the Great Plague in the 1500s and been made a place of worship to protect against any future plague. So in a way, we should all be going there, I feel. Um, in the foreground, you see gondolas um, in the Grand Canal. And my exposures tend to be really, really long. I work with the camera obscura, which is a dark room and just a pinhole as a lens. And I install photographic paper inside this dark room. I photograph directly onto paper which means I, in the end, receive a paper negative, an image with reversed colors. And because I'm doing this, my exposure times are very, very long. So anything that moves quickly will disappear. And anything that moves very slowly will appear like a ghost. And you see this boat in the foreground that has a crane on it like on the right bottom half of the image. That's a boat with the crane that was in my image just for a moment before it moved on. Whereas the architecture of course was there for, for the hours and hours of my exposure time. And then I show you a little bit the view out my window because that takes me to um, speaking about the next image I hung for you which is exactly this view. I've been in the studio since the early 90s and I used to have a beautiful view straight south into downtown Manhattan um, until a developer decided to build this building outside and to document the loss of light and inspiration and view in my studio over the two years of the construction of this building, I photographed um, in about 14 images the loss of my view and equally the construction of this new building. And what you're seeing here is a photograph of the building across the street just before it was finished. And if you wonder what these very large black um, bandana-like things are that are hanging from the scaffolding, it's white plastic with which they shielded the facade during construction. And um, you will find that the image is kind of filled with many small images, which are all reflections in the windows of this new construction. So 
when one stands in front of this piece, and of course it would be wonderful if you could all come over in person and see this because it's much more obvious what I'm talking about. But basically in the windows of this building opposite me are reflections of my building. So I photographed in a way myself photographing the building outside. So I love playing with these um, elements within photography that also give a narrative and give some poetry to what I do. This was, if I'm not mistaken, at least a two day exposure because um, the tall construction had taken up all the light. I needed to expose for so long to even get the least amount of information. And then I'm turning a little bit back to a view of the studio. You see opposite me now this big shelving unit. Um, this is where I keep my prints. It's this large archive that I've built myself. Of course, everything here is self-made because um, what I do is um, in no means customary photography. Um, the, the paper I work with is m almost usually always five feet wide. So I built these boxes. Um, they're long and narrow and I can I'll put the computer down for a second to give a demonstration. I can open them and um, inside will be one of my prints rolled around such a tube. Um, we're taking them out, we're unrolling them from the tube and hang them up to view them. And if we don't do that, they can be stored very nicely and not so in a not space consuming way in my studio. We have labels and numbers which correspond with um, a digital inventory. Um, so I can at all times find my work. And now um, I'm showing Sarah, you. Yep. Uh, I just, we just have a couple questions before you move on. So okay. What is the um, average time exposure? Um, I know it, it ranges uh, greatly, so we'd love to hear that. And, and also, um, Eric Nielsen asks, um, do you dodge and burn what, during the exposure? Um, and do you do that inside the camera or is that later um, as an interesting thing? And just, a, just to one more qualification, if you, if you all could please ask your questions using the Q&A box, uh, that will be easier for me to monitor. Thank you. So all terrific questions. I unloaded um, sort of um, in, a, in a nutshell my technique. Um, now I forgot the first question. Oh, my average exposure time. There isn't really an average exposure time. The Chrysler building image that I first showed you was one of the faster exposures, even though it's a very large image. It's about um, 90 inches tall, uh, 60 inches wide, which is a medium format for me. Um, but it was beautifully illuminated and a north facing view, which is ideal for photography. So that was about an hour or two in exposure. The um, image I showed you, which I made from exactly this space, photographing the building opposite, um, I have to check, but as I said, it was two or four days. It, I've, I've never made an image with a faster exposure than two hours or an hour and a half. The longest exposure I've made is seven months. And that was just in this um, project that I developed together with the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, where I photographed inside their museum and inside their galleries. So these um, greatly varying exposure times have to do, number one, with the factor light. The more light that illuminates the object that I'm photographing, the faster will be my exposure time. So that explains that anything photographed outside in the outside world illuminated by the sun will be faster than anything I photograph inside, like inside the museum, 
and especially a museum which will always look to have fairly low light levels. And the second factor in, that determines exposure time is the size of the image. And because I do these fairly unconventional things with photography, meaning my negative, if you wish, because it is my negative, but it is the final image I present to the world, is 90 inches by five by, by 60 inches. So, so call it eight feet by five feet. And it just takes a lot longer um, for the light to reach all that surface than for those of you who still know conventional photography and come maybe from a 35 millimeter negative, 35 millimeter is a lot smaller than eight feet by five feet. And um, so this is sort of about the exposure times and I determine them for every project newly. And it's always, there's always a highly experimental factor in it, even though of course I have gained many years of experience, which I record diligently so that um, this experience is available to me um, upon my next project. Um, and just because I use the word project, I work entirely project-based. So like the work I did with the Museum of Contemporary Photography in Chicago and with Natasha and her former boss, um, who both invited me to, to work there in Chicago, I, I work project-based in that often alone, sometimes if I'm lucky enough with, together with a museum, we develop a body of work which then comes to exhibition. So because of the scale I work in and because of the effort of building, outfitting, determining cameras, exposure times, I'm not a photographer that can continuously and always photograph. I then, once an image is exposed inside my camera and I am inside the camera during the exposure, obviously not for seven months, but in all other cases, I will be inside for the very long exposures, I build myself um, a little entrance chamber that allows me to walk in and out of the camera without letting light penetrate into the camera space. Um, so I'm inside the camera during an exposure and I do dodge and burn, yes. Um, that is just necessary because of the scale of my images. Um, and then the paper will be rolled up. I put it into a self-made light tight container. I carry it on my shoulders, which can be very hard because photo paper is very heavy, um, to either a makeshift darkroom that we developed and built on site. We had one in Chicago um, in 2001 when I worked with Natasha or if I work in New York here in my studio, I have a second space with a very beautiful large dark room. And there I develop my work by hand. I will show you a little bit how that, how that rolls out, but that's all done manually by myself. And if I'm lucky with my assistants, um, it's a lot of work. In this process of develop, development in, in the dark room, because I rolled the prints through chemistry. I don't have a darkroom big enough where they could be developed face open. There is no manipulation left possible when developing. I just have my experience. I run them through developer, fix, wash, and then I actually for the first time see my image. Did that answer some questions, Natasha? Um, yes, that very much said, and more are coming up, and we're not going to be able to answer all of them. Thank you all for your many questions. Uh, but maybe you could just explain a little bit. Um, there are a couple of questions about uh, one: uh, Is the camera obscura? Is is it the actual size of the print we're looking at? So maybe you could explain how what the size of your camera obscura is and the the object, the the prints themselves, um, and then. One person then asks related to that is since your images are one of a kind paper negatives, how important is it to you to show the original and um, do you worry about damaging these unique 
originals. So can you talk a little bit about, do you show the originals? Do you print these, the paper negatives later? Uh, these are some of the questions that are coming up. I suggest, Josh, that I, um, that I answer these questions and then maybe we move a little bit on through the studio and, 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 and settle down at a later point um, for more questions, of course. So, um, camera obscura means dark room in Latin. Camera is the room and obscura is dark. So a camera obscura, which is my camera, is nothing other than a dark room. And um, I started working with rooms, which is also what Natasha referred to when I worked in Chicago. I, we just found rooms through friends and friends of friends and we made friends. So we found many different rooms that would provide me with a view that I determined interesting. Um, so to make the room into a camera, it needs to be entirely darkened. But that also explains that the room obviously at a minimum has to be the size of my photograph, but much more often it is much larger. I've worked with enormous rooms, way too big, you know, because it makes so much extra work to darken them. But if they provided me with the view I wanted, then obviously I use it. Um, um, but the room couldn't possibly be smaller than my photograph because otherwise I couldn't fit it in there. Um, since the paper is installed, the paper, the photographic paper that in conventional photography would be used in the darkroom, you would project your um, enlarged negative on the paper. That would be the conventional way to do it. I instead take the photo paper roll it out in my camera obscura, install it and expose directly on it. So it is a one of a kind and unique original paper negative that I walk away with after an awful lot of effort and time investment. This is all I have. There is no way of duplicating it. One could, but you would never be able to preserve the quality that I achieve with this direct imprint of an image. So yes, that is what I exhibit. And if somebody is interested in collecting it, that is what my galleries sell. Um, highly delicate material, yes. Um, the works will be mounted in a very specific and archival process um, to preserve their, um, you know, to, to make them flat and manageable and then they get set into frames. So, and in that way, they're very, very safe. You know, um, if possible, we will use um, the UV filtering glass. And so the, the images are nicely protected. Here in the studio, obviously we know what we're doing and I handle them without mounting and framing. It would be too heavy and too cumbersome for myself and my team. Um, so now maybe I just move on to a couple more images. I wanted to talk about what's behind me. This wall that I'm sitting in front of is um, wall, works composed from um, two different projects. Um, left and right, the large images are from my work with the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, where I photographed not only their galleries, but also their collections. And in the center, you can see smaller scale photographs that um, I photographed at the Metropolitan Museum. And the works at the Metropolitan Museum were s the beginning of my interest in working with art and inside museums. I have a slightly smaller um, or quite a bit smaller trunk camera with which I um, were, was able to enter into the Metropolitan Museum, install these trunks in front of pieces of artwork. I chose to work in the Greek and Roman wing. I was interested in the fragmented body in these fragments that um, 
history has sort of um, left us with and looking for the individual beauty in these works. And I, first of all, I found these pieces relevant again for this time, this time in which our body is under attack from this plague um, that so terrified all of us here in New York. And yet um, it's the beginning of my work with museums. So I wanted to bring that together, flanked by um, this image here from the Los Angeles County Museum of Art of the God Vishnu, who is the God of hope and aspiration for better days. So that's a good one to have around these days. And a compilation of an image of mine and um, a ceremonial figure in the foreground, a comb combination, combination I photographed in Los Angeles. And so photographing all these wonderful artworks in Los Angeles also gave me the idea to continue doing this. And I've hung a couple of first experiments that I've made in my studio here of photographing African masks. So there are smaller scale first images of a Bamoon mask here. Um, I hope I'm sort of framing this nicely with my camera in the computer. It's a beautiful mask. And I photograph at the same time the reflection of the mask. So I'm sort of doubling it up. That's what I'm experimenting with also in this larger image here. And um, these this is larger but still small scale for me but at least i'm able to do some work creatively in my studio now i'm walking to the entrance area of my loft here and show you my hall of fame which is for the good days that galleries and museums and exhibition spaces printed invitation cards i would have one invitation card of every show I was included in um, and hang it on this wall to record, um, to have a, have a record of, of where my work was exhibited. And I do want to show you um, probably my most beautiful invitation card that the Chicago Museum made for me for our exhibition. Can you see it? I hope so. So now I will walk over into my dark room and I will lose you for a moment um, because I will lose my internet connection and I will have to reestablish it um, to show you my dark room. Sure, can you just quickly show us the LACMA or the LACMA uh, invitation? LACMA invitation. At the end of there. Of course. Yeah. Can you see it? Yes. So, you know, needless to say, we were all incredibly excited to open the show on March 25th. And we really, we installed it much faster than we anticipated. Um, I was scheduled to work in Los Angeles for almost three weeks installing the exhibition and we were done with the large works we were done after one week, and that was the night that the director had to close the museum. So that was a bit of a heartbreak. And, um, and then nobody knew how anything would ever continue. Um, Until, until the good news came that the show will open in July and will actually have an extended run through the end of the year um, so that whoever is interested has really a large time window to see what we did there. And I will show you our book. Um, We made a beautiful book for this exhibition. Here it is. Um, 
It's called Vera Luta Museum in the Camera. And the title derives, uh, this is an old master painting that I photographed in Los Angeles and we chose, it's a, it's a um, Franz Snyder's still life of a game market, which I photographed and sort of turned into my own piece of artwork. The title um, comes from the idea, obviously, museum in the camera. I worked inside the museum two years. Did I work almost two years full? I worked on site in Los Angeles, photographing the buildings from the outside, the galleries from the inside, and the artwork of the galleries. And every time I worked, I saw the museum projected inside my camera where I would sit and observe my projected image, my exposure. So it's the museum that I invited into my camera and the title of the show and the title of the book. Okay, see you in my dark room. So this is a, a, a brief intermission. As she walks to her dark room, she has to switch um, uh, internet connection. So we lose her for a second um, and then she reappears in her dark room. Uh, thank you all for your questions. Um, I will be, after she shows us her dark room, we'll have a chance to sit down and ask her more questions. Uh, so please uh, keep them coming. Again, we're getting lots of questions, so we won't be able to open, I won't, we won't be able to address each of them. Okay, she's back online in her dark room. So I think this gives kind of a nice view of my dark room. Um, here, these metal sinks are where I do my development. Um, on the side of the room, you see these big white basins. This is where we do, um, where we wash the prints. It's a very long and labor intensive process. These are trays. Can you see this? It's kind of difficult to hold the computer and explain. Um, I have these trays that get set into my sinks and each tray is being filled with anywhere five to six gallons of chemistry. And then we have our paper rolled up and we roll it through the fluids here and go from chemistry to chemistry. Um, developing a print is really um, a work of a day for two people from beginning to end to do it archivally and well. So I can do all of this in my dark room here, which is quite unusual um, at this point that this world that had most, most people have given away um, dark rooms, most schools have deinstalled dark rooms. So um, there aren't really any people around who work on my scale, but there are also very few dark rooms still around. Um, all these things here are my equipment. I have a hot press, which I can use for the smaller pieces. Some of you might still know this um, object. It heats up to a very high temperature and then um, one can flatten prints that fit in there. My large prints never get flattened. They kind of flatten when I roll them around the cardboard tubes that I spoke about. Um, a shelf with archival um, materials on it and a view back onto my darkroom. 
And then I have one last room here in which I keep my book archive and a lot of administrative papers where um, we can sit and do our beloved administrative work. Um, so I'm happy to answer questions and see what, what remains. Um, I, I have a quick question for you, which might require you going back into your dark room very quickly. Can you just tell us a little bit of those moon? Uh, you had some pictures of the moon, I think, above the mm -hmm. above the tray. Uh, what are what are those about? Um, the moon were sort of a diary that I developed because for many years I traveled so much that I no longer knew where I belonged to and. Um, hardly knew where I was. I'm sorry, we have strong reflection of these images from my fluorescent light, but um, these are test prints that I kept. Um, so I started to photograph the moon because on all the travels I, I did, I found that the moon was always with me, thankfully. Um, a constant companion and um, I started photographing the moon from any place I was traveling to with the little point and shoot camera until I figured I wanted a little bit more from, from my images. And I learned actually really only for this project um, to work with a very long, a thousand millimeter digital lens and digital camera. Um, and I learned a lot, of course, about photographing at night, photographing digitally, and photographing an object um, that moves all the time. So the moon images are made digitally and are digital prints, but they remain unique because I like the idea that, um, that the moon really looked like this only once, even though obviously, um, moon phases repeat themselves, but the constellation of the moon will always be, the astronomical constellation of the moon, moon will always be ever so slightly different, and the light and the weather will never be the same. So, so I like to keep works unique also, even though these of course have a digital file from which they stem, but um, I find it also very boring to see the same image twice. So that's the moon project. And we call it, um, um, what's my name? Um, Albescent. Albescent is the project, which is the light, the yellowish light that emits from the, from the moon. Great, thank you so much. What, uh, why don't you go back into, so you can sit down comfortably because we have lots of questions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, so we have, um, we have a couple questions that kind of relate together about um, how you got started. How did you come down this path of using the camera obscura or using photography? Did you, were you trained as a photographer first? Um, and related to that, um, can you talk a little bit about who your kind of historical and contemporary influences um, are? I was trained as a sculptor in Germany until in 1993, I came to the United States on a nine month um, grant of the German government. And um, I, I was definitely at a place where I was, um, I knew I was in for a change with the works I made, these objects I built as a sculptor. And um, I got this, I wanted to be a New York and get to know New York and um, thought, but the grant, this government grant, which is a postgraduate grant, requests that you, 
that one is enrolled in a graduate program, which was also a wonderful opportunity for me, but I decided I really wanted to learn something new. Um, I had a lot of exposure to art theory and criticism and sort of contemporary art, thoughts on contemporary art philosophies um, during my studies in Munich. And I was ready to go a little bit more hands-on and learn something practical. So I enrolled in the School of Visual Arts Photography Department, thinking it would be just so good if I learned how to make decent pictures and develop them so I could print my own portfolio going forward. That's what we did in the early 90s, by the way. Artists kind of documented their own work. They made photographs and printed them. It was actually quite beautiful. So that's how I ended up in the School of Visual Arts in the graduate program where they no longer teach you how to make photographs, but little did I know that that would be the case. You're expected to have learned these practical aspects of photography in undergraduate. And um, I came in and I, I lived in this loft in Midtown, which had a spectacular view over the garment district, which is where I am still today, not in the same loft, but in the same neighborhood. And um, decided the year for the first time to turn my, my little bedroom loft space into a camera obscura and make a photograph with it. And that, that ended up right away to be something like eight feet by eight feet. So I arrived in art school with this thing, this exposed photo paper, eight feet by eight feet, and had no idea what to do with it next, how to develop it, how to fix it, how to handle this very delicate, beautiful photo paper at the time. So I had a lot of learning to do and I learned by myself and I learned from a couple of very helpful fellow students and and that's how I ended up doing what I'm doing. I have a degree, a master's degree. I've stayed in, in New York City ever since, a little longer than nine months, and uh, received a master's degree from School of Visual Arts. Um, but I've never, I never underwent um, an official explicit training in photography. And I think that's wonderful because it allows me to have a completely open mind and be very unconventional about what I do. Um, I've learned a lot, of course. I've learned, I've learned all the things I had to learn to make my work. Um, okay, thank you. So we have a few questions that are all asked in a little bit of different ways, but basically it's how, how do you decide what's going to be a successful subject matter? You photographed architecture and masks and moons. So how do you decide your subject matter? And then when you finally see your finished print, um, how close does it match your initial intention? Interesting question. So subject matter is a big evolution. So, so um, you know, I've come in 1993 and in January of 94, I made my first photograph ever since I'm doing this. I, I'm scared to add up those years, but it's almost 30. And as we, as we, as people evolve and change and develop, so do the things that I care for, and so does the world around me. Um, I photograph what I'm interested in, and I don't often go back. I've, the only place I've come back to time and again is New York, and I live here, and it's my home, and it's my daily visual experience. In the beginning, for better, now often for worse. Um, just because the architecture that's being built today is not very interesting to me. Um, and then there's just a, you know, there's an evolution in who we are as people. And I seem to find that my work goes more and more sort of, I don't know how to say it, inside. Um, having come from metropolitan sites over the idea of voyage and travel and spanning distances and having photographed means of transportation and many, many, many other things in between. I've sort of arrived at 
art itself um, and investigating objects of art, um, sculptures, masks, paintings, investigating them with my own photography just allows me to peel off yet another distancing layer between me and that art and understand I for myself seem to understand it more deeply and see it more deeply as I photograph it. So, so I feel like my work may have become from something very monumental and overbearing to something very intimate and personal. I mean, the person, the, the, the airplanes and the cityscapes are no less personal, but they're less obviously personal than the investigation around an artifact. I forgot the other question. I think you can only serve me with one question, Tosh. Otherwise, um, <laughs> I don't remember. Was there a second question? I think I forgot it too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so quite a few people are interested in, in back to burning and dodging, although I'm going to ask it um, a, a, another wonderful artist from Berlin or living in Berlin uh, from Israel, um, Alit Azerle has asked, um, I, I enjoy the way she frames this question. Um, so she, when you do dodge and burn, um, I imagine it is done through your body language, moving inside the camera obscura. Can you share a bit about this very natural dance? It started with the body and I've built myself tools. Um, so it's, um, you know, I, I, I can see everything as clear as glass projected inside my cameras. I see my image, that's how I frame my image. I determine where I crop and how I crop the image and I see where light and where shadow falls. So consequently, I also clearly see when I dodge and burn what part of the image I am obstructing and which part I don't. So it's not so easy to be that specific with the body, you know, the body can obstruct larger portions, but not with that precision. So I built myself tools with which I work. Thank you. You're getting lots of technical questions. <laughs> Maybe we can also share a little bit between the technical questions and the more content related questions. Yeah. Um, so there's also, uh, have you have you ever um, contact printed your larger pieces? Nope. Okay. Okay. Um, have you ever fallen out of love with photography? Nope. If so, how do you rekindle your passion towards the medium again? Well, you haven't fallen out of love. No, didn't need to do that yet. <laughs> <laughs> you would know when I do, my work would go bad. Okay, the forgotten question. I was reminded of what that was. When you finally see your finished prints, how close does it match your initial intention? It's actually, I appreciate that question. It's an interesting question, yeah. Um, it's a very, very strange experience. I, um, it always does and doesn't. It's always a surprise. I seem to know so specifically what I want to do and how I want to do it. And I'm so used to seeing my work upside down and reversed in the camera. And I have no problem making that transition negative positive in my head. There's no, there, I have no problems with any of this. And I'm so clear about the image I want, but then when it's in front of me, it's always a surprise. And I always, um, um, 
I very, very often take quite a lot of time until I get used to my work. Even if I'm happy, I'm still feeling like a stranger standing in front of, in, in front of something. Okay, the questions are kind of flying in here, so I'm trying to read <laughs> quickly as well. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, a statement, uh, not a question, but just wanted to say how much uh, John Voris uh, appreciated uh, seeing your dark room uh, to assure that, um, and to assure you uh, that as a high school photography teacher outside of Chicago, I still teach my students dark room photography. So thank you. John Wonderful. Voris. I'm so happy to hear that. I think, I mean, I usually find that people love dark room photography and love discovering that, that incredible mystery and, and surprise when, you know, due to chemistry and emulsion, an image appears on a white piece of paper. Yeah, so this might answer um, Anne Rez's uh, picture about what is your personal opinion about traditional photography versus the digital photography uh, that avoids the darkroom process? I don't have a personal opinion, really. I just have a personal opinion about individual images. And I know when I like something and when I don't like something. And I find, I personally, for me, find the wet chemistry and the work, with the immediate and direct work with light and dark, incredibly inspiring and informing. And um, it, it, this is, this is um, the medium and the way for me to express what I'm looking to express. I could not do this digitally. Uh, Jennifer Colton asks, do you feel the abstraction of the sight through the photograph makes the work more abstract or more physical or both? I'm interested in the translation of the physical world into the abstraction of the space. Okay, read it again. I think I get it, but it's interesting. Do you feel the abstraction of the sight through the photograph makes the work more abstract or more physical or both? I'm interested in the translation of the physical world into the abstraction of the space or into the abstraction of the photograph, one could say. Yeah, I appreciate that question. It's really interesting. Um, I, the short answer would be both. So obviously it's an abstraction of the physical world that I'm working with. And I, um, I like the tension and the um, sort of this tenuous um, relationship that remains between the recognizable part of the image that I make and the abstracted part. I, I, I appreciate leaving enough information so that the viewer can orient him or herself as to what we're seeing, but I like to abstract it so that it doesn't become a copy immediately of what we're seeing. And um, so it is an abstraction of the physical world and, um, and so both is what I'm doing. Uh, so Amé Bobien uh, from Chicago, uh, artist at, who teaches at the Art Institute of Chicago. She says, I love to get lost in the darkness and monumentalism of your images, exclamation point. How do you spend your time inside the camera obscura? There's been lots of questions actually about how you spend that time. Um, you talked about going in and out of a, a portal, um, but when you're in there, how do you spend your time well, it's a highly concentrated time. I watch my projected image. I see whether it changes in terms of how, how, how bright or how dark my projected image becomes. I have to make decisions about my um, exposure times following the light levels that I see. I record um, in great detail what I do, how I dodge, where I dodge. Um, it's it's an immense immense effort of concentration. So it's not a picnic in the dark. Um, it's work. It's work of seeing and thinking. 
Is it at all meditative? Mm, it's not something where you can zoom, uh, kind of zone out. It's not. Um, not really. Not really. Um, another another comment uh, from Ashley Rencor. I appreciate this tour so much. I am a recent graduate with a BFA in photography from Chicago. Uh, in my last year specializing in darkroom printing, I felt absolutely inspired by your work and how, how you speak about it. So thank you from, from Ashley. That's so nice to hear. I always love to hear that other artists are interested in what I'm doing. That that's wonderful for me. Thank you for saying that. Uh, so what makes you the most interested in always showing the negatives instead of the colored version of photography or what, what the potential of, of using color paper? Well, this, this kind of relates to the question about the abstraction of the world we see in my images that came forward in that question that maybe two or three questions ago. So I feel like in black and white, I can really go into abstraction much more easily than in color because color becomes so fictional. Color is not as um, linear a translation when you shift tonality mm -hmm. as black and white mm -hmm. is. Um, and um, the reason why I started working with the negative image is really, I wanted a very immediate imprint of my work. I wanted an immediate translation of what I saw in the camera, what I saw in the view that I'm photographing. Um, that's how it all started. That's why I decided to set up a camera obscura um, to receive a very immediate and direct imprint of the outside world into the room in which I was seeing the outside world. And since that initial interest sort of carries through in my work, I, I have continued on with the, um, with, with the negative format. It's also again related to this abstraction issue that we just discussed. It, um, it allows me, if you wish, to, to create a small slight irritation for the viewer um, to create something familiar yet unfamiliar that invites the viewer to look twice. Oh, I know this, but I don't. And why is it this way around? Why is it that way around? And when this kind of investigation in the mind of a viewer starts, then um, um, many more creative thoughts and experiences are probably invited in. If you see an, a photograph of something we and we're so bombarded with ultimate photographs that are direct reproductions of what we saw before. We're so easily shrugging it off and going there. Okay, yep, that side, know it, done, check. And that's not, you know, why would I make all that effort to just say, okay, yep, Empire State Building. Not so much what I'm, I'm after. I have to say, Natasha, that I have tiny little bit of power left in my battery of the laptop. So um, maybe one or two more questions and then I probably lose you. Yeah, well, we are, we're, we're really at the end of uh, uh, the end of our hour, which has been great. But so we will end with uh, one final question uh, from uh, Jenny Sampson in San Francisco. Um, and she says that you, you know, I presume you have spent hours and days on one exposure only to discover that that exposure isn't right. Would you tell us about this experience and any story or experiences that stand out? Well, when they're great, it's great. When they're bad, it's horrible. It's pretty simple. You know, it's kind of extremely daunting when you work so hard and something comes out that isn't good. And when something comes out, that's great. It's the, it's the most wonderful feeling I know in my life. If I, if I make a good image and I see it, I'm the happiest person in the world. Great. And just, just to end on, uh, 
you know, I think uh, Beth Dow brings up the notion of time in your work. And I know time, you have photographed clocks. And I know, of course, time is, is part of it. I would be, would be interested to know about what's the, the notion of time for you and your pictures. Well, I always speak about this triangle between light, place, and time, right? Um, and that, in that triangle, um, an image can come to existence. And um, without any one of these elements, you can't do anything. Um, I like the slowness of my work because it really, really makes me um, think twice about what I want to do, why I want to do it, and how I want to do it. I find the stumbling stones that the work process that I have decided to come up with, um, I appreciate the stumbling stones that this process kind of throws at me because it, it, these are constant, constant opportunities to check in on myself, what I want to do, how I want to do it, what image do I want to make, um, I feel completely overwhelmed by the flood of imagery and um, information that we're exposed to. I cannot possibly um, neither contain nor digest this. And so on my end, I um, want to be careful and um, take caution and be kind of very conscientious about what I put out in the world and whatnot. Great. Um, Vera, this concludes your wonderful tour. It's, a, it's been um, a, a, a very special for you to um, share your studio with, with, our, with our audience that are checking in from around the globe. Um, it's exciting to see um, this opportunity. It's a very, it's a privilege for all of us to see how you work, see how you think. Um, so I want to thank you um, very, very much uh, for your time with us today um, and look forward to the next time we can be together um, physically in your studio. Thank you, Natasha. Thank you for the invitation and thank you to everybody in the audience. And I just want to reach out to all the artists in the audience and wish you all best of luck and courage to make the work you want to make. And thank you all for interest, for your interest in art. Great. Bye bye from New York, I say. Goodbye from New York and goodbye from Chicago. Uh, thank you all and we hope you join us for our future uh, virtual programs. Please check out mocp.org. Uh, they're every week. Okay. Thank you very much, Vera. Bye-bye. Bye, Natasha. Bye.